So let's start. Okay, I think we stopped here. And um, you have um, assignment for this week, I think. It's based to what we have done so far. This is of Hyokus, remember the lost uh, constellation. Now let's talk about the celestial sphere. So from our point of view on Earth, it seems that all the stars are blue, you know, like an uh, imaginary sphere. And that's what the ancient thought, okay? They thought around the Earth, you have a crystal sphere and all the stars are blue on it. Of course, this is not the case because this star and that star, they can be very far from each other, but we don't see the perspective, okay? We don't see how deep this is. We, from our perspective, everything happens like all the stars seems to be at the same distance, even though they are not, and they are blue on the sphere. Except because you see the, the earth here, so this is the earth, and let's say you are standing here on the earth, that will be called the horizon. Okay, so this is horizon. You see the, the earth is actually curving away from the horizon. So horizon, if you look at uh, toward the ocean, that will be as far as you can see. And then the boat, you know, this seems to um, disappear down. So of course, we can only see about half a sphere. We cannot see below. Does that make sense? So that's why that's called the celestial sphere, but we only, uh, the stars will be visible and, and not even all of them because during the day you cannot see the stars, but that will make half a sphere from your point of view. And this is called the horizon. This is called the zenith. Zenith will be just above your head. Is that clear? Okay, so that's the celestial sphere. So this is a model. And uh, I would like to buy it, you know, but it's three fifty dollars. So I'm waiting to save a little bit, but it's a great model. So this is the Earth, and this is the Sun, as seen from the Earth. So as seen from the Earth, you see the Sun goes around in three sixty-five days, and of course um, the Earth is rotating. So when it's facing the Sun, is day. And then it rotates counterclockwise, and then it's not facing the sun, it's night. So during a one given period in the year, you're gonna have a day and then night. So of course, you cannot, from your point of view, so let's say this is uh, Miami, you know, Miami is not far from the equator. So you have your horizon here, right? because the Earth is uh, curved, of course, and you will be able to see only those stars here, okay? Because the other part of the star here, it, it will be daytime, so you cannot see it, okay? So the stars that you can see depends on the season. When the sun is here, okay, you cannot see all the stars here. You only see those stars there, does that make sense? So from your point of view, the sun is going around the earth this 365 days. And at a given time in the year, you only see this part here when it's dark. When it's uh, daylight, you cannot see this part here. So that's, that's why, depending on the season, you can see certain stars and not the other ones. Does that make sense? So again, the, the sun, uh, goes around the Earth here yeah, from our perspective 365 days and then the Earth is rotating about its axis in 24 hours when it's day it's facing the Earth uh, it's facing the Sun so we cannot see those stars okay you have to wait for la uh, light to go away you, you have to wait for night time to see only those stars here yeah? and it, depending on your latitude so we are lucky here because we are very close to the equator. So we can see a little bit here underneath the equator and we see above it. Okay, now if you are located here in New York, so you won't be able to see those stars here. Is that clear? So you can think, um, so again, you see how this is the axis of the Earth going from North Pole 
and south pole and it's tilted relative to the ecliptic plane. Okay, so if you have a test next, or oh, by the way, test number two will cover only what we are doing now. It's not cumulative. So it's going to cover all constellation stuff and uh, celestial sphere stuff, right? So my, my tests are not cumulative to make it uh, easier for you. So anyway, this is the ecliptic line. Okay, it defines the ecliptic plane. Just to remind you that the ecliptic plane is that flat disk where all the planets, including the sun, are located, right? So this is called the ecliptic plane. This is called the equator plane, equatorial plane. Okay, it goes through the equator and you see there is a tilt here. At that intersection, this is called the uh, equinox here, right? The spring equinox, equinox. And you see during the equinox, the, the sun is projected around Pisces, which is the fish. And last time we told you that it's going to change and we are transitioning to Aquarius. Therefore, the famous uh, 60s song, 70 song, 1967, Age of Aquarius, right? So that's how it works. Um, any questions so far? Yeah, I have, I'm, I'm happy I found a very nice um, model here. Remember that the stars that you see here are not actually next to each other. It seems to us, but that's not true. Okay, they could be very, 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 very far away. It's just that we have no perspective, right? So from our point of view, all the stars here that form the constellation seems to be glue on that sphere. And remember along that ecliptic line here, you have all the zodiac constellations, including Ophiuchus, the missing one. Okay, so this is also same another one that I found. You see all the constellations. Um, this is here, this is the equator, this is the ecliptic plane, and all the constellations of the zodiac are around there. Okay, this is also the sun, it's the same story. Okay, same thing again and again. You see that the earth is rotating. Okay, so just interesting stuff here. So this is the equator. And along that axis here, going north, you have Polaris. Okay, you have the, the, the north, north star, Polaris, that, that's showing us the north. So if you are at the equator, so located here at B, so this is you, you know, I don't know where on the equator, but when you're going to look here at the horizon, you're going to see the north star. So from your perspective, if you are located here at the equator, the north star is going to be just above the horizon. But if you are here on, in Antarctica, the north star will be just above your head, just above your head, right? If you are somewhere here, like in New York, okay? then the North Star will be above the horizon. We are almost at the equator in Miami, so Polaris will be just above the horizon, not at the horizon, just above it, a little bit above it, like 20 degrees. So if you are looking at the ocean, not you don't want to look at the ocean, you want to look at Polo Dordel North, and you aim at Polaris, so that angle here, so that's going to be the latitude of Miami. Okay, so that's how back then, before the GPS and all the technology, we will be able to find the latitude, okay? So you look at the horizon, this is the ocean, this is the north. You aim at Polaris, that angle here was your latitude. So very useful for navigator, of course. So we talk about that. We watched that video. Oh, I forgot to have my list of things that I want to say. OK, so let's talk about, um, again, to make sure you understand that the stars or the constellation that you can see depends on season. So 
uh, which season we are in. So let's take, for example, Orion. So first question on the test or, or in the assignment, all the rays, light, the light has inside it the image, right? It carries information. But light from Orion, okay, is all parallel to each other because Orion is so, so, so far away. So even the rays from the sun carrying, you know, the image of the sun, of all the information about the sun, all the rays are parallel to each other because it's so far away. So you see, when you are in December, so December Earth is located here. So this is sunrise, so it's day, daylight. You don't see the stars here. So in December, you cannot see a focus because it's all the way there. And it's daylight, so you cannot see what's going on on the other side. And then sun set here, it's the beginning of the night. And you see that at midnight, because the rays are parallel, Orion will be just above your head. Okay? So if, if you are located here, so this is uh, seen from above, from the north. So if you are here, right, counterclockwise, Orion will be just above the horizon. Okay? So if you put a straight line here, Orion will be just at the horizon. And then December, and now it's spring. You see that at midnight, you're not going to see Orion anymore. You're going to see Virgo, right? And Orion will be seen only just above the horizon. And then the Earth rotates. And then here, you won't be able to see. When you are at uh, sunrise, you won't be able to see horizon, uh, Orion. See how it works? So that's because during the day, you cannot see the constellation. So that's why it depends on the season, which constellations you can see. Okay. So this is here, it's rotating in this direction. So then, for example, in June, you will not be able to see Orion because during daytime, we don't see the constellation. Only when the night starts, then you would be able to see Ophiuchus just above your head, but not Orion. Okay, and then you come back here, September, it's the fall. So you can see Orion just above the horizon on, on, on the east side. So the best, best time is now. Now you can see um, Orion, you're going to start to see Orion very well. In December will be the best time, best time for you. Is that clear? And um, you see, this is a rotation of the Earth. So you can see this is the pole here. The, the other pole is on the other side. So that's why. That's how it works. I'm not going to go into details, but just to give you an idea. So this is Orion, um, beautiful constellation. You have Betelgeuse here, which is a red giant. Huge, 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 huge one. And then here you have Rigel. It's a blue star. You have the belt of Orion, you have the sword here of Orion, and here you have the nebula, Orion nebula. So very easy to spot. Here it's the Scorpius. Okay, it's part of the zodiac constellations. And remember, there was a question on the assignment, maybe on the test. You see the stinger here aim at the center of our galaxy as well as the teapot. You remember here you have a little teapot and the teapot here and the, the tail aim at the center of our Milky Way. So this is the uh, uh, lion. Okay, you can see the constellation, Aries, and the very famous vein queen, <laughs> at least definitively, you, you should, at least there in one, one of the things you will remember from this class, right? The vein queen of Africa, it makes a W Cassiopeia. So let's talk about Cassiopeia. You see, on the celestial sphere, all the star seems to be glue from our perspective on that sphere at the same distance. But it's not what's happening. Actually, they are not bound together, okay? They are not glued together because of gravity. They are quite far from each other, right? So you have this star, which is really far, 
that one here, which is here, this one here, which is there, that's your W, and beta, which is here, right? So they are very far away from each other, light and light years away. They have nothing to do with each other, right? They are not glued together by gravity. It's not a system. So sometimes you have systems of stars that orbit their uh, uh, center of mass, but that's not the case. It's just from our perspective, this seems to be uh, uh, like um, together, right? Which is not uh, which is not the case. Okay, so again, so for example here, uh, maybe it's the big deeper. I'm not sure, but you see, they don't have to be close to each other. It's just the projections you are projecting on on the background, far away background. Okay, so something interesting here. If you are at the equator, then if you look north, the north star would be just above the horizon. If you are at the North Pole, you see the Polaris will be just above your head. And if you are here, for example, in New York, you see Polaris, of course, you have to look north, but it will be above the horizon. And this angle, again, between the north direction and Polaris will give you your latitude. So if you took some geometry, you know, back then in school, you see that this angle here, that angle here will be the same as this angle there. So it's very basic geometry. This is because this line is perpendicular to that side. This line is perpendicular to this side. So that will be your latitude. And that's how Polaris was used back then. Okay, any question? So you see here, same state tell you, telling you the same thing. This is the ecliptic plane again, part of the disk with all the planets. This is the equatorial plane because the Earth is tilted, right? 25 degrees about, and that's going to be your latitude here between the equator lane, uh, line, equator line, and here that will be your latitude. Okay, so at the equator here, Polaris is seen just above the horizon, which is cool. We are at uh, Miami, we are at uh, 25 degrees. So that will be at the pole. Polaris will be just above your head, which is called the zenith. So the way the stars move, it depends where you are on Earth. If you are at the North Pole, the, the star seems to go around in circle all around Polaris. If you are at the equator, they, go, they, they, they rise east and they kind of set this way. So they make like half a circle, east and west, east and west. If you are somewhere in between, like in Miami, you're going to see that kind of motion here. Okay, so that's what you will see. And uh, let's see if I have an app. I don't know if it's this one. Okay, so from your perspective, if you are not at the equator, you're going to see that rise in the east, set in the west. Some stars do not disappear. So some stars close to the Polaris, around Polaris, they are not going to go um, beyond your view. They just go around like this. Some stars disappear, okay? They, they rise and then they set. So that's why during the night, you know, some, some, at some point you can see a star and then at some other point you cannot see it because it has been moving under the horizon. So this is your horizon. Is that clear? So you see here, sometimes stars, they don't disappear. They just go around Polaris. Some of the stars, they, they, they rise east and they set west. Okay, so if you want to learn more, dig more, you can find a lot on the internet. I'm just gonna move along. Um, I don't know why I have this. This is the scorpion, that is Sagittarius, and this is the 
center of our galaxy. Okay, um, that's the same thing. Oh, that's maybe you're gonna have a lab about that. Did you do that lab where you find the coordinates of uh, of stars? Not yet. Did you do the lab about the um, telescope? Did you do the telescope lab? No. Are you all in person or all online? I'm just taking the class. Oh, you just take the class? You don't have to take the lab? You doing in person? And uh, did you do the telescope? Not yet. Okay. I didn't know you could only take the lecture. Okay, that's interesting. So anyway, on that celestial sphere, uh, you can find the coordinate of a star. So you start from here, you see that point here where uh, the, the ecliptic plane and the equatorial plane meet. Okay, so you can go in this direction. So it's in two dimensions, okay, it's 2D. 2D, you need two coordinates. So first coordinate here, it's called the... Um, um, here, latitude and longitude, right? So you can have the first coordinate, you go this way, that will be in hours. And then for the latitude here, right ascension, it's called, that will be in degrees. So this is in hours, that will be in, in the degrees. So I'm not going to bother you, you know, finding the coordinate of stars. Usually it's done in lab, but that's how it works, right? That goes in hours. This is similar to the longitude, and that goes in degrees, okay, between zero degrees and 90 degrees. So that's how it works. So back then, we used to have those things. So that was before the app. So today, you have an app, you search, okay, where is Jupiter? Choo -choo 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 -choo, and it's going to tell you where. But back then, I was teaching this class like very, 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 very long. Go like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we had to use this. So the way it works, you see, this is north. Here you have Polaris, you see? Polaris, and you see all the stars uh, moving around Polaris, right? And then here you will say, okay, we are in September. September is here. 15, 10 p.m. So you will move this and you will see the scar that you were supposed to see. And then it says north. So you will move that to the north. North is here. And then you can see all, all the stars and you can look, uh, uh, find um, which, star, which star is which. So that was back then. So you can uh, pass it along. From, so you see here, the, the whole is Polaris. So this is for the North Hemisphere. Okay, if you go to the equator, Polaris is gonna move all the way up at the horizon. You catch? <laughs> so the, that's, that's, uh, that was back then. Okay, so for example, midnight, that's February. That will be the sky that you can see. So that will be the north horizon. That will be Polaris here, you see? And everything rotates about Polaris here. You have the big dipper there. And along the ecliptic, you're gonna have all the zodiac, okay? And when the ecliptic and the equator meets, that's the equinox. That's how it works, right? Okay, so there is two special planets. You, you remember, as I told you right now, you can look at Jupiter, you can look at Saturn with a good pair of binoculars. But those stars, not stars, the um, planets, Mercury and Venus, you can only see them. So typical question for a test. Uh, you can only see them in the morning or in the evening. And Venus, you can see it with your naked eye. It's uh, very bright, okay? Why is that? Because those two planets are between us and the sun, okay? So they go, they go around like this, you know, they're gonna move faster and then they overtake us and then they go around. So for example, here you see during the day, 
course we cannot see anything so this is days this is night 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 day 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 the sun is setting and then you can see it right thank you yeah pass pass it along you see the whole whole is the polaris at the top you can match the time with the month and you see that all the stars are revolving around polaris you can make the wheel spin is that clear so here the the, the sun is setting you can see venus is very bright and that's why it's called a shepherd star because um, in the morning, you know, they will take the, the, the sheep and the, so they will see Venus here. And then the Earth keep going here, but it was overtaken by uh, Venus and Mercury. And now it's the opposite, right? So this is night, 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 morning. You can see them. And then during the day, you cannot see them. So you only see them in the morning and the evening. Okay, so typical question, it's easy. Any question? So during the summer, it's easy. We already talked about that. That's called an asterism. So it's not called a constellation. It's just like a geometrical uh, figure um, that um, is defined by very bright stars. Okay, so you have Vega, Denim, Altair. This one you can see during the winter. So we're going to start seeing it. And it makes one, two, three, four, five, six. Six is an hexagon. So you have Procyon. Do you remember? You can see it with your naked eye. It's part of the little dog. Sirius is part of the big dog. It's the color. Okay, it's the brighter star in the sky. Regan, remember, it's a blue star. Belongs to Orion. Aldebaran, um, it's a red star. Belonging to Taurus, it's the eye, fiercy eye of the Taurus. And here you have Capella and Pollux. Pollux is part of the Gemini. You know, Gemini is one of the zodiac signs. The story, they, they are the fundators of Rome. Um, they were twin, Pollux and Castor, Castor and Pollux. Okay, so I have a short video. So I'm going to skip most of it and just just the end. Oh, but I have to connect the sound. And I have to figure it out how it works. And I have to find a video. Um, let's see. You see something called winter goodbye. Ah, ah, here. And I skip to 226. And here's my of the key of the 20 brightest stations from Astra toward the east. The star pattern called the winter hexagon, covering almost half the sky. This asterism incorporates six constellations and eight of the 20 brightest stars visible from Earth. The winter hexagon definitely puts its stamp on the season. The most recognizable constellation in the winter hexagon is Orion the Hunter. Bright blue Rigel marks one of the stars in the winter hexagon, and it also marks Orion's left foot. If you take Orion's belt of three stars and look to the west, this will lead you to the next star in the hexagon, Aldebaran. Aldebaran marks the eye of Taurus the bull. This star is a red giant almost 68 light years away from us. Taurus has a small V shape of five stars for a face and two long horns. One of those horns connects to the constellation containing our next star in the hexagon, the yellow star, Capella. Capella is 42 light years away from us and is the brightest star in the pentagon-shaped constellation Auriga the Charioteer. Greek myths describe Auriga as having difficulty walking, which led him to invent the chariot. Although it appears to be a single star to the naked eye, Capella is actually a star system of four stars in two binary pairs. The last four stars of the winter hexagon come from three different constellations. Just to the east of Capella are the stars Castor and Pollux. These stars make up the head of the Gemini twins. Castor is almost 50 light years away and is actually a group of six stars. Pollux is 34 light years away and is actually two stars orbiting each other. 
The bright planet Jupiter is among the stars of Gemini and will make the twins easy to find. Just below and to the south of the Gemini twins are the two stars that mark Orion's smaller dog, Canis Minor. The brighter star is Procyon and the dimmer star is Gomisa. Procyon is the eighth brightest star in the night sky, but that can't compare to the last star in the winter hexagon, Sirius. Sirius marks the eye of Orion's larger dog, Canis Major. Sirius, aptly named the Dog Star, is only eight light years away, making it the brightest star in the night sky. So there you have it. In the west, right after sunset, Vega, Altair, and Deneb, the stars of the Summer Triangle. And a few hours later, the winter hexagon shines brightly in the east, featuring Rigel, Aldebaran, Capella, Castor, Pollux, Procyon, and Sirius. And it's all there. It's a cool video because we'll review everything. And I will post a assignment for next week too. Okay. Any questions so far? So we're going to talk more about uh, telescope. And so we start a new unit, okay? That will be unit... Uh, no, we don't start a new unit. It's still unit 3, but it's the last part of unit 3. So telescope, telescope, the big, big thing about telescope, they have to be uh, to be as big as possible for two reasons. First reason, you want to collect, it's like a bucket, you want to collect as many photons, right? Particles of light as possible. So you want to have less, uh, more contrast. So you want to have your image as bright as possible. So that's why it has to be big. Second reason, is to improve the resolution and we're going to see why okay so it means bigger means a better resolution what does it mean a resolution so i have two students here i have francesca and i have chelsea they, they are separated right i don't see them close to each other okay it's a good resolution but if i go very 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 far away and i look at them even with the telescope they seems to be fusing together right that means the resolution get bad so to have a good resolution that means you can separate two objects and the resolution will be the smallest distance you can tell two objects apart is that clear so for example if you are looking at instead of looking at students i can look at the headlight of a car okay here i can resolve the two light, but if the car is very, very far away, I cannot resolve them anymore. They fuse together, right? So to have a good resolution, this means that the distance you can, um, you, you can tell them apart is the smallest possible. So to, good, to have a good resolution, we will talk about it, but one thing you want is the telescope to be as big as possible. So nowadays we make reflecting telescope on Earth like 10 meters, right? That will be very, very large telescope. So when you buy a telescope, if it says good magnification, magnification times 10, it doesn't help. Because a small fuzzy thing that you make 10 times bigger, it's going to be a big fuzzy thing. It doesn't really help. Okay? So telescope, of course, you can see objects in different wavelengths, X-rays, gamma rays, radio waves, visible light, and you can do what it's called spectroscopy. Right? We'll talk about spectroscopy. So spectroscopy, for example, you can use a telescope to find out you know, how fast the galaxy is moving away from us. And that's how they found out that the universe is expanding, but it's speeding up. Because back then, when you look far, 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 far away, galaxies were still moving away, but not as fast as they are now. So that's how we know that back then the universe was expanding, but not as fast as now. And, and that's because of dark energy, and we have no idea why. Okay? So if you have a large telescope, you can think of light. Light is two things at the same time. It's a wave and it's a particle. So if you look at uh, light, like little, little particles called photons, you see if you have a large telescope, you will be able to collect as, as many as possible. Right? So nothing special here. You can even do math. 
So, for example, if you compare, so your your eyes, okay, it's an optical device. So you have an opening here, right, and then the image, the image is formed in in the back of your eye, and it will be upside down. But the back of your eye is connected to your brain that has learned to put that image back right, upright again. Okay, so your eye is like a camera. It has, it's like a lens, and it's like a lens, like you can make one, it's called a pinhole camera. You see that, that's like, it's your eye, that will be your image, image meaning the, 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 the object you are looking at, and you see the object here goes in the back of your eye, on your retina, upside down, and it's connected with the optical nerve to your brain. Your brain is smart that it put the tree back upright. Isn't that interesting? So there was this, uh, I'm taking a tangent, but there was this scientist who did an experiment. He, he, he was wearing glasses without taking them out. Um, glasses that put things upside down, right? So for example, he would put those glasses, everyone was upside down. After a while, his brain learned to put them upright again. That's how our brain, you know, is always dynamic, right? They, it learns and adapts, it's amazing. It's not static, it's constantly learning. So anyway, if you compare our eye, which is a lens, to a telescope, for example, a six meter telescope, our eye is about six millimeter in size. The telescope, typical telescope is six meters, so between meter and millimeter, you have a factor of a thousand. So if you increase the size by a factor of a thousand, the area is multiplied by a thousand times of a thousand is a million. That means that with a telescope six meter, you can get an image a million times brighter. Okay, because the size of your bucket, you are collecting all the photo is multiply by the size square, right? Because the, the area depends on the size square, the radius square. So that's why it's very important to have a telescope as big as possible if you want to have an image as bright as possible. So there is a square here. Okay, so it's not too, uh, too much of a math. If you go from five meters to 10 meters, you multiply by two the radius, Okay, the size or the diameter, but the area is multiplied by two squared by four. So it will be four times as bright. Does that make sense? So it's not, not, too, um, um, not too hard. And I, I brought a small demo. I don't know if it's going to work. We're going to see. Um, so anyway, problems with telescope, that's in your assignment. A lens, you, uh, you see, Especially at the age, light, because it bends, and the amount it bends, it's called refraction, depends on the wavelength. So blue will bend more than red, and that will be white light. So that's a problem, of course, because you're going to get a fuzzy image. Last time, we already talked about it here. You know, even with your camera, that's what you could get, okay? So it's not only a problem with uh, telescopes, it's also a problem with camera. That's why we don't use refractive telescope anymore, if you are professional or even amateur astronomer. Of course, if you have uh, binoculars, you, you're going to still use lenses, and this is called chromatic aberration. Okay, so basically I'm doing your homework right now. And um, another problem, so let me show you the, see if I can, uh, because I think it's also a question in your assignment. No, I just want one. Okay, so let's see if it works. It's 
So if I ask you for the Simons in a telescope, if you have a refracting telescope, right, like a binocular, binoculars, you have, it's like two telescopes next to each other, you have the objective and you have the eyepiece. The job of the eyepiece is to, to oh, sorry, the, the job of the objective is to bring something very, very, very far away, close to you. So I want to show you that. It works. You see here, I don't know if it's going to work. Yeah, but you are on the other side. That's a problem. <laughs> Let me, I'm going to take my, it works. Okay. Hey, can you see the, the arrow here? Yeah. Okay, so if I do the something like this, um, I don't know if you can come closer, but you have the image. Can you go? See the image? So if I move a little bit further, you know it's going to get smaller. But do you see it's pointing in the other direction? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's how our eyes work. So this is our eye here, the lens, and this is the retina. Right? Isn't that cool? Yeah. You want to see that? So do you see it's upside down? Okay, not upside down, but it's uh, it's like in the mirror. Okay. It means it's pointing to the left, and this one is pointing to the right. See that? And that will be your eye, and that will be your retina, and you see things reverse, and then your brain put them back. Is that? Can you all see that over there, or you are not interested? Not like I saw from an angle. I saw. See it? And they're also done. Did you see it? So when we look into a mirror, is that also inverted? Yes, it's going to be inverted. I mean, like we touch. Yeah. But not not for the same reason. Mm, different. So if we put in mirror, that means this is my right hand. So what's happening in the mirror? That would be my left hand. So the the idea of this is to bring something very. I don't know if I can do it with here. Oh, you see, you see the door. Look, look, it's a very small door, but it's there, right? So if you, if you do that under the sun, for example, uh, you're gonna have the image of the sun. So I'm cool. Yeah. Okay. We will have this sort of mirror. Look at that. You see that? You see the image of the lightning. So if you do that with the sun, you have the sun here. So you have an image of the sun, but all the energy is focused at one point. That's why you can serve a target. So the image of the objective, the idea of the objective is to take something very, very far away, bring it close to you. And then you can have another magnifying glass to make it bigger. Because the magnifying glass, this is not a magnifying glass. It doesn't work as a magnifying glass. But if I do that close, 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 then I have a virtual image, and now I have something bigger. So this is magnifying, okay? Depends how far from the object. So that's how it works. Ideally, everyone would do like lab and hands-on. Okay. Hello, hello. So Tesco, um, we have an issue uh, with, um, what is called, it's because of physics, it's called um, diffraction. So one light, one light, why, why do we have a problem here? So remember I told you that when something is very far away, everything merged together, and it's, you have a hard time to tell these two objects could be two stars apart. 
And the reason for that is because in physics, um, when you have, not in physics, but physics explains that, it's called diffraction. When you have a wave going through an opening, and that could be out your eye, eye is an opening, it could be binocular, it could be a telescope, you see, the, the light will spread, spread apart, okay? it will bend around the corner. Get that? It works also with water. If you have water here and you have wave, and here you have an opening, it's going to spread apart. So this is called something called uh, diffraction. So let me tell, show you just what it means. It means if you have two stars here, they are not uh, fused together, two stars orbiting each other, for example, one is going to go through the opening. So it could be a telescope, it could be your eyes or binoculars, anything that try to collect this light. Instead of having two points, you're going to have like, a, it's going to spread apart, right? So this is still good, but if you make the opening too small, or if it's too far away, and it also depends on the wavelength, now those two objects fuse together and you cannot tell them apart. So this is called diffraction. Are you with me on that? So how much it's going to spend around the corner, how much it's going to spread, depends on how far it is, okay? If it's too far, okay, it's going to fuse together but also the size of the opening. That's why you need a very, very big telescope. So if I ask you for the next test, why do we need big telescope? Only for two reasons. First reason, you want to have a bright image, a lot of contrast, so you want to collect as many photons as possible. But also, you want to have big opening, so light does not spread too much. So that's why bigger is better. And if I have two minutes here to show you, uh, there is a very nice sims. It's called, uh, what it's called, Diff interference. So you see when you have a, an opening here, like going through an opening, it's going to spread apart. So if you want to tell two objects apart, that's going to be a problem. So if you increase the size of the opening versus a small opening, so um, big opening is going to be better. Okay, it doesn't spread that much. And small opening is gonna get worse. Is that clear? Okay, big opening, not too bad. Small opening, very bad. So that's why if it says telescope Walmart, $40, magnification times 10, just crap. Doesn't help. A fuzzy small thing, you make it big, doesn't help. The other thing we're gonna see, it depends on the wavelength. You see that if you look in red, red makes things worse, blue make, makes things better. Okay, so it depends also on, on the wavelength. Okay, so that's because everything at the end is physics. And um, okay, so I'm going to take attendance, I'm going to stop.